Pervis. Pervis is a nuclear physicist from my memory. Uh, he's a social activist and envir environmentalist, and he's um, had many awards for his work. And he's going to speak about uh, whether Islam has always been is a historical fact. That's from my, my memory. I'm not. Yeah. Okay. Pervis, please. Thank you. It's been an extraordinarily rich day, rich in terms of ideas, information, analysis. Like me, many of you must have been deeply moved looking at what Karima Benwan had shown to us, those men and women who had fallen to the religious right. We heard accounts, saw their pictures. When I looked at the movie clips that were put together by Nadia Alfani, I said to myself, change the language from Arabic to Urdu, change the faces a little bit, and make it a little more, a little more violent, and I'll feel that it's my home, Pakistan. <laughs> so thank you, Mariam. Thank to all the organizers for this very rich fair that we've had. Even as we meet and we talk over here, there is blood which is reddening the soils of countries across the world. This is being done by Islamists fighting for an Islamic state. They want a state that will be run upon Sharia. And it's everywhere. ISIS, we don't know whether Kobani will fall tomorrow or not. We see that Afghanistan is teetering on the brink. Shall the Taliban take over by next year? We don't know. We don't know when Boko Haram will next seize girls and sell them off as sex slaves in Nigeria. We don't know what's going to happen to Libya where there are competing extremists. And it's all over, but nowhere is it more interesting than in Pakistan, my country. It came into existence three years before I was born, and it came into being as a state for Muslims. It is called the Islamic Republic of Pakistan. It has been run for most of its life, the 68 years or so, by an army that has already always imagined itself as more of an army for Islam than as an army which would defend the territorial borders of the country. And yet, paradoxically, today that army, that state, and that government is under bitter attack by those who would want to replace the Muslim state that Pakistan now is with an Islamic state. And so in the last 10 years, we have lost 50,000 people. There have been bombs in mosques, at shrines, bombs in public marketplaces. And until recently, there was practically no condemnation of that because it was seen as something that was being done for the right cause, for creating an Islamic state, even though the methods were considered not quite right. So this is the phenomenon that we see now across the globe. They're fighting for an Islamic state. But what is an Islamic state? That question is not so clear. You could say where there's smoke, there's fire, fine. That if these people are willing to blow themselves up as suicide bombers so that they can establish an Islamic state, well then there must be some kind of an idea, an Islamic state, perhaps. But I would humbly put before you that 
even those who blow themselves up, even those who are fighting for an Islamic state today across the world, do not know and have no evidence that an Islamic state ever existed in history. Why do I make such a huge assertion? That's because in the Muslim tradition, in Islam, there is only one book which is above everything else. It is considered literally the word of God. And in that word of God, there is no mention of a state. There is not even an Arabic word for state. There is something that could be construed as meaning that, dollar, but it's not what it, it's not a state. It's more like a community. It could be argued that Prophet Muhammad created a, an administrative unit, the state of Medina, as is sometimes called, and that it was a state which was, which was faultless, the perfect state, a utopia. At best, it was a proto-state. It had, there are no r r uh, written records, but because all of those appear to have been destroyed, but historians, Islamic scholars who had written about the Medina entity, state if you like, some decades later, had said that there were 63 elements to a document which was signed when Prophet Muhammad went from Mecca to Medina. This is called the Misaq e Medina. And those 63 clauses have now become the object of uh, intense scrutiny by scholars. I happened to go through those 63 just before coming here. They are largely about blood money, about what each tribe must pay to the other. They are about which tribes are to be equated with which other tribes. So there were Jewish tribes over there, and those Jewish tribes were viewed differently earlier on. They were now equated by Prophet Muhammad. There, was, there were issues of uh, whether women should be given shelter. And the answer was that, yes, you can give them shelter, provided their families agree, etc. But this does not constitute, this does not make a constitution. There is no mention over there of administrative units, no mention of whether taxes are to be collected, no concept of army, of police, of jails. So although this worked brilliantly, Prophet Muhammad was, after all, no ordinary man, brilliantly it worked in the sense that the feuding tribes of Medina came together, their, their tribal rivalries, enmities were, were then just went away. And this was the beginning of the expansion of Islam. But there were crucial things that were missing from that document. Most importantly, who was to be the ruler of the state or whatever entity it was after Prophet Muhammad? He appointed no successor. Furthermore, he gave no idea of how the successor was to be appointed. And this led to, as you know, the enduring schism within Islam. It led to the emergence of Shiism. The fact that whoever could, through, tri through exploiting tribal rivalries or asserting the rules of, uh, of tribes at that time, could become caliph, did become caliph. But it was a very bloody process. And although, it is, the, the four caliphs after Prophet Muhammad are held up as being the four righteous caliphs. 
And that period, known as the Khulifai Rashidin, is held up as the golden period of Islam, yet the fact is that all except one of the three died very violent deaths. And in fact, one of them was lynched by a Muslim mob while he was reading the Quran. So the fact is that there was no means by which it could be decided who would be the next ruler. What this meant was that in subsequent times, the, the caliph would be, well, whoever could make it to the top. And this is what we then saw for centuries. Now, during those centuries, sometimes there would be not one, but two caliphs, and on one, in one particular period, there were as many as three caliphs, each commanding, or each um, allegedly commanding, the, the, uh, the, the allegiance of the entire ummah, the Muslim community. So that's the history. It's a very checkered history, but it had periods in it which were of uh, military expansion, of intellectual development, and this is what gave to Islam an amount of glory. And in fact, between the 9th and the 13th centuries, we know that in Islam was really where a lot of intellectual development took place. The fact is that at a time when, the Europe, when Europe was in its dark ages, there was a lot of genuine activity, not just taking science from the Greeks, but actually developing science within Islam. And so today, as Muslims look back, they hanker for those glories. The caliphate is therefore appealing as something that existed when Islam was great. There is a lot of nostalgia among Muslims today, and that accounts for the fact that if you were to go into the streets in a Pakistani city, or perhaps in many Muslim countries, and you were to ask, do you want the caliphate? And there are more chances than not that you will get yes, because those were the great good times. Today, the Muslim mind is very confused. On the one hand, there is an acknowledgement of the fact that those were good times, but really they cannot be brought back. The, the Muslim mind wants to believe that the caliphate would be a good thing to have, but at the same time acknowledges that it cannot, that the difficulties are very great. The Muslim mind wants to believe in a unified ummah, that all Muslims, by virtue of their religion, are the same. And yet, that same mind understands that this is very far from a reality. Take the Bangladeshi or the Indian or the Pakistani Muslim who goes to Saudi Arabia or UAE or elsewhere, and he knows that although, the, the, although he's supposed to be the same as anybody else by virtue of being a Muslim, yet he is not regarded as such, that he is discriminated against, that um, should he be accused of a crime, that he will get the, th that it'll be next to impossible for him to defend himself. And this is why practically every week or every other week you have beheadings of those who go over there and are accused of uh, being smugglers of, of heroin. 
The Muslim mind's confusion about the Sharia is a very interesting one. Last week, my colleague who teaches political science in qaid azam University told me of this. He had uh, given a lecture to his class, political science class, in which he described the legal system in a secular democratic state and the legal systems in Saudi Arabia and in Iran. Then he asked the students, he said, uh, which would you rather have? Uh, the, the, would, would you rather have a state which is run by Sharia or in the Islamic way or would you rather have a state which is secular democratic and with no exception they all said we want an Islamic state we want a state run by Sharia so then he posed the question he said suppose you're accused of a crime, in which country would you prefer to be tried? <laughs> Saudi Arabia, Iran, or the United Kingdom? No one put up a hand for Iran. There was one hand for Saudi Arabia, and all the rest for the United Kingdom. So he asked why. Earlier on, you said you wanted an Islamic system, but why don't you want to be tried in Saudi Arabia? And a student said, we believe in Islam, but we don't believe that there is real Islam in Saudi Arabia. And so that's the level of confusion that exists. In fact, I think there should not be confusion. In fact, I think things are pretty clear because an Islamic state based upon the ideas that you would find in the works of Maulana Maududi or of others who have, uh, yeah, Sayyid Qutb, would be hell for minorities because in an Islamic state, the minorities cannot be given the same rights that Muslims enjoy. They must accept to becoming zimis, which means second class citizens, living, living at the sufferance of the Muslims. And they can only live provided they pay a tax called jazia. Now, even without the Zimmi and the Jazia, things have been very tough for Muslim, things have been very tough for minorities living in Muslim countries. I grew up in Karachi at a time when uh, we, when things were way, way better than today. My immediate neighbors were Christians. There was a Zoroastrian, a Parsi at the other end of the street. There was even a Hindu in the neighborhood. Well, that neighborhood had earlier on, become, had earlier on been mostly Hindu, but after partition, the Hindus left. This is years after partition. There were Christians, there were Parsis, and there was even the occasional Hindu. Now I go back to my neighborhood, my mother still lives there. And there is not one non -Muslim, there is not one non-Muslim family over there. No Christians, no Parsis, no Hindus, just Muslims. There used to be a fair number of faculty members who were non-Muslim in my university. I've been teaching there since 1973. <coughs> now, I don't see any. In 1994, this was 10 o'clock at night, I heard two gunshots. 
I ran outside my house. My house uh, is in the was in the university at that time, and I saw two men fleeing from there. I went inside the house, and there was my neighbor lying on the ground, bullet to his neck, bullet to his heart. He had been my student in the physics department earlier. He was then a faculty member, and he was an Ahmadi. Ahmadis are uh, perhaps the worst discriminated people, mo most persecuted community in Pakistan today. So I told my daughter, she, had, she was 11 years old at that time, I said, go run, get a blanket. We wrapped him up, put him in the car. His wife was besides herself in grief. Or he died on the way. Those blood stains took um, many years to finally wash off. But the next morning, well, I missed this out. When I was putting him in the car, I didn't have any help from the neighbors because he was Ahmadi. The next morning when the burial had to take place, nobody turned up for his funeral prayers. And these are colleagues. These are colleagues with PhDs, PhDs in physics, in math, in history, whatever. They would not pray for him because he was Ahmadi. So Islamic, an Islamic state will be hell for minorities. It already is everywhere. But an Islamic state will also be a hell for Muslims. It is a hell for Muslims now in Pakistan. The Shias in particular. Those Shias who had fought for Pakistan, fought for a separation of Muslims from Hindus in 1947, today find themselves increasingly pushed off by the rest of society. And they have retreated into enclaves. Even those enclaves are bombed. And so, in an Islamic state, the Muslim is not safe. If you go outside a mosque today, on, during Friday prayers, in Pakistan, any city, anywhere, you'll see guards with machine guns. Why? Because they're afraid that somebody from the other sect, and sect doesn't just mean Sunni Shia, it's within Sunnis as well. You have the Barelvis, and you have the Deobandis, and you have the Salafis, and you have the Wahhabis, and you have this and that, and it, the fractionation keeps getting more extensive. And since everything is to be decided on matters of faith, well, then this is what happens. Why is there confusion about this in the Muslim wine? There should not be. Look at what Pakistan was earlier on. Look at what it is now. Look at what it used to be in Muslim countries across the world and look at what it is now. All this comes because faith is used as the parameter. Pakistan is just one example of a state that is heading towards failure because of an excessive emphasis on religion. An Islamic state will be the end of justice as we know it, criminal justice, the very concept of blood money. You kill someone, you can get away by paying for it. So the rich can kill and they can get away. Let me give you the rates, the current rates in Saudi Arabia. If you kill a Muslim man, you have to pay 300,000 rials, else 
they have the right to kill you or the state will kill you. If you kill a Muslim woman, it's 150,000 riyals. If you kill a Christian or a Jew, it's 50,000 riyals. Man, man, man. If you kill a Christian or a Jew woman, it's 25,000. If it's any other religion, it's 6,666 riyals, man. And if you kill a woman of any other religion, it's 3,333 3, riyals. It doesn't say if, what happens if you kill an atheist. <laughs> you might even get paid to kill them. Yes. It's fascinating. There was a guy called Raymond Davis. He was, he was a CIA operator in Pakistan. The man was pathological. He went on a shooting spree. He killed people all over. And then the American embassy discovered that there is this blood money you can pay, Qasas. They bought him out. And so there, there he is in Texas. That's it. Islamism. An Islamic state is the end to social progress. Everything that we've learned over the years, should we become Islamic as a state in Pakistan, we'll, we'll go back to the 14th century, to the 7th century. A woman today in the northwestern frontier province called KPK cannot get an x-ray cannot get an ultrasound because that would be peering inside her body. And the mullahs say that that gives sexual thrills. Yes. Just this year, we have had three rulings from the Council for Islamic Ideology. The first removes the age limit for marriage. You can marry a seven-year-old if you like, five-year-old if you like. It removes the need to remarry. A man, if he wants to remarry, he can marry up till four. He does not have to ask his wife, his existing wife. Or if he has two, he doesn't have to ask those two. If he has three, he doesn't have to ask those three. As long as he doesn't cross four, he's fine. This year, the Islamic Ideology Council also removed DNA as evidence in a rape case. This could be magnified many times over if, God forbid, Pakistan should become a genuine Islamic state. There are forces against it. There are people who are fighting. We do not have to give up. We will fight. We will keep fighting. But there's one thing that I want to request all of you for. Please. Don't make cartoons. You know what happened after those cartoons? You know what happened after that silly film on Prophet Muhammad? They went on a rampage. They burned banks. They burned cars. They, they put people like me, like many others, hiding under the table. You want to do that again? Do it. We may not survive this time. It's of no fault of ours. But yes, it's your right to free speech, whatever. But if you do it, know the consequences. If you light a match at a gas station, it may be the gas station's fault, but the consequences you know. So it's up to you to decide. What's your I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's for you to decide. You do what you want. But I'll tell you what impact it's going to have upon us. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm at the end of the meeting.